Hey guys, this is uh, week four or episode four of my weekly uh, reviews and updates. Uh, I got a couple things to address uh, right away. Uh, too many movies, you won the barn, but I haven't heard from you or got any contact information. If you're friends with me on Facebook, shoot me a message. Shoot me an email at davidparker1986 at live.com. Hopefully you'll see this so I can send you your your movie because you won. Uh, also, from now on, make sure you leave your email address on that comment for the contest. Uh, you know, I, I figured I'd start this, uh, this uh, video out. A little bit, you know, no, typically I wouldn't talk about movies I saw in the theaters, but you know, I saw a couple movies in the theaters and I think it's worth talking about a little bit. These aren't technical reviews, just, uh, you know, a couple thoughts here and there, uh, whatnot. I saw Wonder Woman uh, over the weekend uh, and uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Uh, you know, I'm not a huge DC fan when it comes to their movies. I know that their animated stuff is actually pretty cool. I remember seeing some of the cartoons that I dug. Uh, they were way more violent than expected and uh, just were really well done. Better than the Marvel cartoons I saw. So uh, I, I did not really like, you know, the Nolan Batman movies. I know they're not bad movies. They're just not for me. But, uh, you know, so I, I was kind of a little apprehensive about Wonder Woman. It was two hours and I think 30 minutes or somewhere around that mark. So I'm like, okay, a two and a half hour comic book movie. And it was late for me. You know, I get up early. So I went to the theaters and I checked it out and it wasn't that bad. It was pretty entertaining. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, I thought it was cool that it took place during uh, World War I. Uh, it's definitely a fish out of water scenario with Wonder Woman at points. And it's a man on a mission movie, kind of similar to the Dirty Dozen, uh, kind of going across the trenches and stuff of World War One, which I kind of enjoyed. And there's a character called Dr. Poison in here. She's this mad scientist with some prosthetics on her face. Uh, I loved her. I thought she was cool and a uh, really memorable character. All in all, I thought it was actually a, a fun movie and I enjoyed it. Although the fights at the end had me dozing off because it was really late. Uh, as for Guardians of the Galaxy 2, you know, James Gunn, uh, he surpasses the whole superhero movies. The superhero movies for me are, I go to the theaters, I watch them once, give them my money, you know. I understand there's a lot of hate towards the superhero movies. They're popcorn movies for me. I don't revisit them. I don't typically buy them. Uh, it's a one and done. I don't really cherish them. I know uh, a lot of people say, if you want that to stop, you got to stop supporting it. But you know what? I enjoy it. So I'm going to do it. I enjoy seeing them with my friends. We watch it once and we leave it at that. But James Gunn's a little bit different. I think he's uh, one of those directors that his his uh, you know artistic views come into his uh, movies, no matter what they are. Uh, I've always loved Slither and Super. Super, I think, is one of the best superhero movies, I guess, technically it counts. And Guardians 1 is probably my favorite Marvel movie. Uh, a lot of fun. Uh, as for Guardians 2, I think it's a little bit better. Uh, the cast in here is amazing. I mean, you got the, the Guardians, of course, but... Michael Rooker comes back as well, but we got an additions. We got uh, Sylvester Sloan with a small role. Kurt Russell. Uh, Ving Rams has a uh, tiny role in here. So it's just you add those guys into the mix. Uh, I love it. And uh, it's it's the first time I've always enjoyed watching Michael Rooker. He's always one of my favorite actors, even as a young man. And stuff like Cliffhanger and Henry. And uh, he pops up in stuff like Rosewood and Mississippi Burning. He's just everywhere. And he always does a tremendous job. He, he always gives these A-list performances, better than a lot of A-list guys. And he never really got the recognition he deserved. He was always there, and he always got roles, and people, I think, knew he was a good actor, but he never got that breakthrough role. And, uh, you know, with The Walking Dead, which, you know, I'm not a huge fan of, but I, I did enjoy his stint on there. And uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, he was kind of getting some deserved attention he he you know, deserved attention is what I'll say. But in Guardians 2, uh, James Gunn gives him a lot to work with and he he does a great job. It, it's a really touching role. And uh, Yondo, Yondu does a really good job. Uh, Rooker does such an amazing job in the movie and it was so great to see this guy who I've watched his career growing up uh, just actually become like that a-list spot or it is he deserves it and he kills it when you give him that he kills it. He, he does such a good job every time and it was just, uh, you know, I kind of wanted to share that that story with, uh, you know, that Michael Rooker, you know, just getting on top for once. And it's, it's good to see like one of those good, you know, gritty actors do it. Like he always was rooting for like Brian James or somebody like that, that just was in the good movies, the big movies, but he never got that perfect role. He always did tremendous. But he never got that list, that role that is, is you know, going to uh, let a broader audience like accept him. But now he's starting to get that and it's great because he's one of the best and it's amazing. Uh, saying that, let's get into the reviews. I talked a little bit, spilled my heart out. Uh, the first review I will be doing is uh, one of Blue Underground's uh, De 1972 Death Line. This is on Blu-ray, DVD, and uh, I believe there is, uh, yeah, there's both editions in here, which is really awesome. Uh, my Blu-ray is still in the player. Sorry about that, guys. But yeah, 
Deathline. If you guys have uh, not seen this one, it was released on MGM DVD back in the day. It was really muddy looking. This was made in 72. It is a British film, but it's actually made by an American director, which is really cool. Gary Sherman, who would later go on to do Dead and Buried, which was made in uh, 1981, but it was written by Dan O'Bannon, has Robert Englund in it. It's a pretty infamous uh, horror movie. It made the video Nasties List. Uh, what makes Deathline so cool is, besides, of course, it's Blue Underground. They cleaned it up. It looks great. It sounds great. It's packed with extras. Uh, the movie itself is actually a really solid horror movie. It's it's one of those times that, you know, in like 68 and 72, we started getting those dark kind of nihilistic horror movies or nihilistic horror movies, like Night of the Living Dead, like I said, in The Last House on the Left. And uh, this was made in, in the UK. So you kind of have that hammer, classy, uh, almost like lighter horror movie coming in, but it also has that uh, new kind of uh, mean-spirited uh, stuff coming in. So it's kind of a, definitely a transitional horror movie from that time and uh, I, I really dig that to be honest uh, it has Donald Pleasance in, it, Pleasance in it and like half the movie has Donald Pleasance in this like typical police procedural but he does such a good job he's funny he's witty he's a likable character he adds his own little flares to it he does a great job in that and uh, like I said half the movie is police uh, procedural and the other half of the movie is this kind of dark gritty nasty movie uh, basically in, in the subway with this cannibal the plot is uh, years back uh, the subway uh, these miners were in the, this area and it caved in and they couldn't afford to get him out so they left him there uh, surprisingly they survived generations and they're all there's one guy left he's kind of mutated and he's taking care of his uh, his pregnant wife who he seems very sick and uh he's at he's at his end he, he's he's delusional and crazy and uh the only thing he can say is mind the doors from here in the on the subway uh, he's a cannibal because that's the only way they could survive, so he's picking out people here and there. Nobody really pays attention to it until uh, this government man disappears, and that's when uh, more people start to come in and look into it, and especially Donald Pleasance. Uh, it's nice. This movie has these scandals uh, through line going through it. Originally, it was a scandal that they let these people just die. In, in the miners and then uh, we have this scandal with Christopher Lee's character who has a small role uh, a good role a very good role but a small role where he's this government man that comes in and says stop paying attention to this disappearing government man because this guy's got a shady past and they dig into it and he's disappeared they'll look into his past and they'll it'll give them a bad name so it's another scandal cover up uh, originally uh, it's this cave in that created this this cannibal and now it's this uh, cover up that lets him continue to thrive, I guess, for a short time being. But uh, there's a couple horrific moments in here. And on the DVD, I don't even remember. There's a scene where the, the cannibal rips a girl's shirt off and her breasts fall out. And I was like, I don't remember that. That seems way darker than I remember this movie to be. Uh, there's a seven-minute tracking shot that shows the cannibal's lair and, uh, and its gore and grit and everything. It, it, it has its nasty moments. And uh, it's definitely that transition period. But, uh, you know, Donald Pleasance is always great. And uh, Christopher Lee has a small role. He's good. And Donald Pleasance has a great rapport with the guy who played his partner in that they're, they're very funny there's some humorous moments in here but it's not out of place because Donald Pleasant's character is funny not the movie itself uh, there's a situational gag with the tea which kind of reminds me of something out of a, a giallo uh, I can't think of the one with the bad coffee but they always have these weird little gags and they're like that so it's definitely a European mentality even if it's made by an English director. But uh, the Blu-ray has uh, a commentary with the director and producers, interviews with all sorts of people and their actors, pretty much all the main players that are alive come back and do an interview and commentary. And they have fond memories. They, they, they know what the movie is. It's a pretty solid movie. They know it's good. And uh, they appreciate fans of it, which is really cool. Uh, but yeah, it, it looks good. It sounds good. And it has a reversible cover, which is great as well. Uh, you know, Blue Underground does a great job. And uh, this is a fairly solid, kind of underrated movie uh, with uh, a nice atmosphere and a cool story with that folklore cannibal, you know, cave-in stuff uh, mixed with a police procedural. But uh, that's Deathline. Check out the trailer. In the depths of the city, a nightmare grows real. A sinister evil that festered for generations in its moldering tomb. Who stalks those deadly shadows? Whose cry echoes their horror? Whose blood will flow when it strikes again? Sure, he was alive when you left him. How many times? Are you absolutely certain he didn't come up after you? Yes. You mean he did? He did not. 
Yeah. I think we were lucky. Why? Whatever he saw was probably watching us. Well, how could they survive without food? Hmm. Because I should imagine that as each one died, the others ate him. Is there any way out of here except up those stairs? Drop it. Why don't it? Is there? Oh. You tell me! What strange hunger drives it to prey on the young and strong? Cat? Cat, are you all right? An experience in ultimate terror. So fearful that no additional scenes can be shown in this preview. The next one we have here is uh, from Arrow Films. This is Cops vs. Thugs. Yeah. Uh, this is the first time I've seen this director's work uh, besides Battle Royal, of course, which he did much later in his career. This was made in 1975. Uh, this guy did a slew of uh, uh, Japanese crime films, which I have not seen. The Battles Without Honor set, uh, tons and tons of movies. Uh, Doberman Cop, I believe he did as well from Arrow. But he's just done a slew of these, and this is my first experience with his crime movies. He actually did Green Slime as well, which is batshit crazy that he, you know, I, I've never seen Green Slime, but the trailer, and I've had it for years. I've seen the trailer with your jackal, and it just seems out of this world, this weird alien invasion movie. We got Battle Royal, and then we got something like Cops vs. Thugs, and he's done so many movies. Very prolific, pro, uh, prolific guy. So yeah, Cops vs. Thugs is this kind of a Yakuza tale of, well, Cops vs. Thugs, but this this cop and this Yakuza guy become these good friends, and they have these complex situations, and this new cop comes in, and he's like, no more ties between cops and Yakuza. And this cop's trying to play this line where he doesn't want to, you know, be outed as a Yakuza, you know, uh, you know, friendly, uh, but he also doesn't want to betray his friends, and it, it leads to this complex situation. There's some good action in here, some shootouts. Uh, it's, it's pretty uh, grim and gritty and dark, and uh, it's all around just a well-made movie. I had not uh, seen any of this guy's work, like I said before, and I was impressed. Uh, I, I enjoy the relationship and the complexities, and you know, the bureaucracy of these guys, like, well, how they sell things and how they uh, they underbid each other, and have these elaborate setups to go under people's toe, uh, to go under people's nose without getting caught, and you know, doing stuff like that. But it, it's a really cool movie with a lot of complex things going on. Uh, and, and some good action in here and uh, you know it has a tragic ending uh, and it's kind of reminds me of something like Goodfellas which came out much later in 1990 uh, that you know once you're on top you, you gotta sometimes end up on the bottom as well but yeah there's this nice uh, loyalty and uh, this uh, you know this machismo about being a, a Yakuza and a cop and there's lots of fighting in it and I'd say this one's really cool to check out uh, the title may be a little silly to people but it's it's far from silly it's a it's a very serious crime movie uh, but very well made at the same time check out the Arrow story on on the disc, there is a, a archival interview and stuff, and then there's a, you know, some essays and stuff, a video essays I believe on here as well, which are interesting, and talk about uh, his career and how how strange it was. Deep down inside, we sense that something is off even before we learn who the actual owner is. It's a brilliant moment on the part of Fukasaku who, with the simplest of shots, throws us off balance.
The next one we have is uh, Sad Vacation. This is a documentary about Sid and Nancy. Uh, and, you know, I, I know uh, about as much about the Sex Pistols as your average everyday Joe. I know uh, that uh, Sid Vicious, uh, not his real name, of course, you know, supposedly killed his girlfriend and then uh, OD'd on heroin and died. And that's pretty much all I know. I never saw the Alex Cox movie. I think uh, Repo Man and Straight to Hell are the only ones I've seen by him. So I'm a I'm I'm one of these people that is looking at it from an outside view, uh, and I'm sure that's probably best for this movie. I'm sure experts on Sid and Nancy really don't want to watch this documentary. I'm sure they know a lot about it. Uh, that's, that's what I got the impression of. There's tons of interviews with people that were there, uh, kind of uh, semi-famous celebrities like actors and musicians that were actually in the Chelsea Hotel when the whole thing went down. Uh, they go into you know Sid and Nancy's past a little bit, how uh, you know di how disturbed they were, and they were so young. It's it, it's it, it's it's a tragedy, but also it, it's it's kind of strange how they romanticized this, uh, you know, these two heroin junkies, uh, life and death, and you know, like a, a, a punk Romeo and Juliet. Uh, it's kind of a disheartening, actually, you know, that people would look to this as like a love story in, in a way. And, you know, it's just kind of a, a sad, kind of a gritty and grimy story. And I think a lot of people will romanticize things when they're given the chance. But it is an interesting story, and uh, it is definitely a talking headstock. I have some footage with Sid in there and uh, and whatnot, but not much, really. Uh, they talk about their, their past and whatnot. All in all, I, I felt that it was okay. It's not really something I'm generally uh, going to go bananas over, but I said for an introductory piece into Sid and Nancy, I think it works well because I didn't know a lot of this stuff. And uh, for me, the best part about it was to take a look into New York City at the time and, uh, you know, also see... Uh, you know, the horrors that drugs can do to people, even though I've already, I think everybody in this day and age has probably seen somebody firsthand and knows what this kind of stuff will do to people. But uh, yeah, there were some interesting stories in there and it was interesting to see New York City at this time. Uh, check out the trailer. Sid had charm, he was funny, he was witty. He was very clever in a, in a, in a, a Sid, sort of Sydney sort of way. They were, doing dope and then probably also their methadone and tuinols and you know whatever they could stick in their face. Nancy's a groupie, Nancy's a junkie, she's this and she's that. She said I'm going upstairs and splitting my wrist. So I followed her. And she did. You know she was like I'm silly up and I was like, we tried to kidnap her once. They went to her and says look we used to look really good then look at us now. Just standing next to him, kind of thinking, did you kill Nancy? Did you actually stab Nancy? At the very least, there's no way that Sid could ever be convicted beyond a reasonable doubt. Fuck it. You know, we should snort his ashes, you know what I mean? And, and I did, and I thought we all agreed to it, but then no one else did it. The next one here is a, a Sam Peckinpah movie. Yeah. I've never seen it, called Cross of Iron. This is, I guess, based on a book, I believe. But uh, this is a World War II movie. But the cool thing is, uh, it takes place on the German side, which isn't typical. I don't think I've ever seen that many uh, World, War II movie, or World War II movies that take place from the uh, perspective of the Germans. Uh, they're not actually fighting uh, the, you know, America in this one, United States. They're fighting Russians, which might be soften the blow for a lot more people, you know, to actually let their guard down and be sympathetic towards some of these characters. It is war, and a lot of times these people were just following orders, unfortunately, even if they didn't believe it, but... Uh, so yeah, what we have here is uh, James Colburn, who's uh, you know in a couple of uh, Peck and Paul movies. He is basically uh, this uh, this really great corporal. Um, he he doesn't really follow the rules. Uh, he does what he wants, but he's such a good shoulder so, soldier. People let him do what he wants. He kind of runs this this group of. Uh, uh, really good soldiers as well, and they're kind of low on the totem pole. They end up giving a lot of shit jobs, and they're really good at what they do. Uh, Maximil Shell, uh, Shell, I believe it, Maximilian Shell, the actor. I, I believe he's in Little Odessa. Uh, comes in, and he's this kind of you know officer who's after his uh, Iron Cross, and that's all he really cares about, kind of like a Medal of Honor. And he wants to get it, but he doesn't really know what he's doing. Uh, you know, your typical uh, setup with uh, something like Platoon, where you have Lieutenant Wolf, who has no idea what he's doing, and he's in charge of all these people's lives. We have a similar story here. He's cold and heartless, and just a kind of an arrogant prick that no one really likes. So there's going to be clashing here. And uh, there's some scandals amidst uh, some battles here and there. And uh, James Colburn's the only guy that can get in the way of uh, 
Max Mill Schill getting his Iron Cross. So that doesn't really end well here. There's some double crossing and uh, tragedy ensues. Uh, there's some really great moments in here. Uh, the bond between uh, James Colburn and his men is uh, the the driving force of this movie. There's some really grotesque war things uh, as well. There's a moment in here that if it was in a horror movie, you might be like, hey, that's funny, but uh, it, it's played so realistically and it's just awful. There's a moment where this uh, this truck, uh, there's this body in the mud and the truck runs it over and it just looks like goo. And it is, it makes your, your stomach turn, to be honest. But yeah, James Colbert's great in it. Uh, all around, it's a really good movie and it got me tearing up at the end and uh, I wanted vengeance. That's all I'll say. It's a movie that want, makes you want vengeance, but the ending is so not like your typical Hollywood ending. Uh, and, and it's a comedic ending, but uh, there's a lot to be said in that ending. Uh, it, it's kind of amazing what they say in that ending. Uh, there's also a scene in the hospital, which kind of goes into this surreal territory. Like I said, I think this was based on a book, but there's also a sequel called Breakthrough, which I have not seen, which carries over some of the same characters without spoiling too much on uh, I don't want to spoil anything. The more characters I tell you, the more you'll know about it. But uh, yeah, just a really impressive movie with some good action. And uh, it's more of a drama, but you know, it's got your typical slow motion explosions here and there. But uh, there's a moment in here, like I said at the end, when James Colburn has this flash of all his men who uh, had passed. And it, it's a great moment. He has these moments of, it's similar, it's a funny thing to say. He has these moments of all his men who have passed and good moments, seeing them smile and everything. And, and similar to a scene at the end of Guardians 2, which actually touched me as well, where he looks back and the stakes are high. And uh, he sees all his friends and, you know, in his best moments with them. But yeah, Cross of Iron. I'd really recommend that one by Sam Peckinpah. It's a little long, and there's some moments that are almost like exploitation films when they come across the Russian girls. Uh, I don't want to give... Russian women, I should say. But uh, yeah, I don't want to give too much away. Uh, yeah, that's Cross of Iron. Check out the trailer. In this century of great wars, no other compares to the mammoth struggle between Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia. From this savage era comes a story so big that only the epic camera of Sam Peckinpah could do justice to its theme. As the once invincible German army was hammered back in the year after Stalingrad, survival came to depend on two kinds of soldier. Leaders of men, such as Steiner, and seekers of glory, such as Stransky. Why did you ask to be relieved from uh, duty in France? I want to get the Iron Cross. Steiner is a myth, but men like him are our last hope. I firmly don't believe that the ideals of the German soldier, even the German soldier, soldier no longer has, has any ideals. He's fighting for his... Life. If they're the last of us, Scrancy and Steiner, then God help us. There are orders that no Russian prisoners are to be taken. Get rid of him. Since all quiet on the Western Front has any film probed the realities of war so deeply. Whatever Sam Peckinpah does generates an excitement of its own. The need to find love. Go back. And the inner conflict to face death instead. Now, Sam Peckinpah achieves a new high with Cross of Iron. Why do you want it so badly? As he looks beyond the mere winning of medals to the meaning of courage itself. It's just a piece of worthless metal. It's not worthless to me. You're not dealing with just another Nazi party type. He doesn't live in the same world we live in. I know, he's living in my world now. They're pulling back to the beach-headed Kuban. No rear guard. How do you understand this, platoon? Regimental headquarters, come in, please. Fuck it, can you hear me? All the lines are out. You're the only person that stands between Stransky and his iron cross. Good 
without Steiner to contradict him, he'll get his arm crossed. Stransky in Paris, Steiner. God knows where he'll be. Even bigger than the Wild Bunch. More exciting than Straw Dogs and the Getaway. Now, Sam Peckinpah brings you the most epic story of them all, Cross of Iron. Even without your Iron Cross, Captain. I said, where's the rest of your platoon, Sergeant Steiner? Captain Stransky, you are the rest of my platoon. I'll show you how a Prussian officer can fight. Then I will show you how the Iron Crosses grow. The next one I'll be checking out, uh, I actually picked this up from Walmart and I, uh, I put it on my Voodoo so I didn't even have to open it. So I watched it on Voodoo so uh, maybe the picture quality was not perfect on there. I don't even believe there's any special features on here. So this is City Heat with Clint Eastwood and Burt Reynolds. I was most interested in this movie because uh, the combo of Clint Eastwood and Burt Reynolds is super bizarre to me. I never thought that those two egos clashing in a movie would uh, actually work. But, you know, City Heat does. It's definitely your uh, kind of uh, gumshoe detective movie, uh, ga old gangster movie. Uh, and I ended up really enjoying it. Uh, Burt Reynolds plays his gumshoe who gets tangled in because his partner Richard Roundtree uh, screwed up. He gets tangled in with these two different groups of mobsters. One's led by Rip, one's led by Rip Thorne. And uh, what's really great about this, uh, well, Clint Eastwood's still an ex-cop. Used to be Burt Reynolds' partner. They both get entangled in it. But what's beautiful about this movie is uh, the one uh, gangster is Rip Thorne, and he has Robert Davi working for him, which is a very familiar face. And the other gangster, I'm not really particularly sure on him his name but he his two main goons that follow him around the whole movie are no other than uh uh, Nicholas Wirth, one of my all-time favorites, and William Sanderson. These two guys would end up going on to be in a movie called Hologram Man together where they both played goons and they have this kind of back and forth. It's great to see both of them, uh, you know, shooting their guns, Tommy guns running around because uh, I love William Sanderson and Nicholas Wirth. Uh, he's, he's one of the best goons of all time. Both these guys are really great and it was really cool to see him in this movie as, uh, you know, kind of uh, supporting roles with, with good roles in here as well. But yeah, uh, it, it is definitely a comedy, you know, uh, a lot of hijinks going on with guns and dodge and fights and Burt Reynolds quips and Clint Eastwood quips constantly at each other's throats. It's funny. It has its moments. Uh, it has its moments of action as well. Not overly violent or anything. Uh, but I would say this one is definitely worth checking out if you like that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, I like Burt Reynolds. He's a really funny guy. Clint Eastwood's classic as well. And it, it was great seeing those uh, character actors pop up here and there. But uh, the ending felt a, a tiny bit flat at times. Uh, the, the ending let me down just a tad. That's all I want to get to. But uh, all in all, I, I enjoyed it. I laughed, uh, and it was really cool seeing the cast. Uh, I wish this one was talked about more. Uh, it, it's it's a fairly fun movie that I don't hear anyone mention ever. <laughs> Listen, don't kill me, buddy. Let me say this to you one more time. Do not kill me, buddy. Do me a favor. Don't save my life anymore. My pleasure. Clint Eastwood and Burt Reynolds in City Heat. Clint is a street-smart flatfoot. Burt is a wise-cracking gumshoe. And together, the heat is on. It's 1933. The times are tough, and the streets are mean. street, huh? Two guys down there on the right and two guys down there on the left. There's a, four guys down there all together. We did all right, huh? What a team. <laughs> yeah. Roll it down further. law to lie down in the middle of the street. I never laid down on the street. Sure you did. You were hit by a truck. What truck? The next one that comes along. Does anybody knock anymore? How about a fast game of sleeper? Never heard of it. 
Well, it's simple. You go ahead and make your shot, and I put you to sleep. Good evening, gents. Shorty. Hi. Is this a private party, or can anybody attend? I thought you were going to set this one out. I lied. OK. Give me the keys. Give it to him. You got it. Come on, I raised over here. Let's go. I'll huff and I'll puff out. Well, it's about time. Clint Eastwood and Burt Reynolds in City Heat. Need we say more? The last one we have here, I can't get out of this thing without a Charles Bronson movie, right? This is the German import of The Mechanic, and it is Region B, so you can't, so is Cross of Iron as well. But yeah, uh, I didn't get the Twilight Time Blu-ray, but this is a, a Michael Winner movie. Uh, Michael Winner did six movies with Charles Bronson, Death Wish 1, 2, and 3, Death Wish 3 being the last, uh, The Stone Killer, or Stonewall Killer, I can't think of that one, uh, and Shadows Land, and of course, The Mechanic. Uh, the Mechanic was also remade with Jason Statham. Uh, this is the first time I watched this movie. Uh, yeah, this is a dark role for Bronson. Bronson usually has that lighthearted, but, you know, tough as nails, um, let's get down to business, but a heart of gold underneath that, that mean exterior. No, Bronson's a bad guy in this. Everybody's a bad guy in this. He stars with Jay, uh, Jan Michael Vincent, which is kind of funny, but yeah, he's his hitman called a mechanic who uh, kills people in elaborate ways, uh, try to cover his tracks. And uh, Jan Michael Vinson, he starts to take under his wing and teach him. And uh, of course, uh, that makes some people unhappy and the family sends him after Bronson. But you know, Bronson doesn't go down without a fight. Uh, this one's really good and really different for Bronson, like I said. And there's a really dark tone to it. It's a really dark movie. Uh, but uh, I, I really enjoyed the damn thing, and the ending's great. I don't want to give too much away, but there's, of course, you know, some turmoil in here. And uh, Bronson being this teacher and Jan Michael Vincent being the student, of course, you know, things aren't going to be... Uh, <laughs> aren't going to end well in this movie. Uh, like I said, a very dark movie with some really strange moments in here. There's a scene where this girl threatens to kill herself, and that one seems almost straight out of a horror movie. Bronson's cool and collected, but he's on his way out because he has an ailment. But uh, regardless, I, I would really check out The Mechanic. I think uh, it's an interesting movie, and it gives Bronson something a little bit more meat on uh, the bones to do. Uh, a unique role for him, and uh, it's not like your typical Michael Winter stuff. I know Death Wish is dark and gritty here and there, but Death Wish 2 and 3 are over the top, although uh, pretty, uh, they, they are very mean-spirited, but they are very goofy at the same time, and uh, this is more like something like Chata's Land or Death Wish, which uh, is really cool to check out. I'd really recommend uh, The Mechanic. <laughs> Yes. Mr. Bishop, we would like you to go ahead. There are a thousand ways to kill a man, and one assassin knows them all. Murder is only killing without a license, and everybody kills. But when the best in the business... There are times when I could use a backup. ...takes on a partner... I'm gonna teach you all I can. The last hit of his life. Play to win, do you? I'm gonna pick my own mark. Could be his own. The Mechanic is a non-stop thrill ride. Charles Bronson. Jan Michael Vincent. The Mechanic. How long till she goes? Just about now. And uh, I guess let's get into uh, the old contest to see who wins this one. Uh, oh, first, let's do the shout-out. Uh, the shout-out today is going to be for um, the Indiegogo for uh, American Guinea Pig Song of, uh, Song of Solomon, which is being directed by Stephen Bureau, who runs on Earth Films. It's going to have James Jim Van Beber in it, who's you know in Deadbeat at Dawn and a director in his own right. And it has special effects by Marcus Cook and, of course... Uh, 
uh, toe tag pitchers, not uh, Fred, but Jeremy Cruz is in there doing the effects. So that's really cool. Uh, and uh, this one looks pretty batshit crazy. I kind of am interested in these American guinea pig movies because we're going to get something different with every one. But uh, yeah, uh, the link will be below to donate. You can get all sorts of cool stuff. They've already surpassed their goal, but the more they get, the better the next one will be. It's already made, so it's not like you're not going to get the product. It, the movie's already completed. So that's American guinea pig Indiegogo below. Check it out. And, and let's get into uh, the new contest. We have, I'm at the old contest. Who's going to be the winner? This is for the Void Region 2 Blu-ray. We got, we got all this here. So let me dig in. Let's see who's going to win. Get more and more of these, which is good. I don't want to look. We got Brian Murata. Hope you can read that, Brian. Can you? It's probably backwards. My terrible, terrible chicken scratch. But Brian Murata, uh, shoot me a message, man. Uh, you won the void. Uh, get me your address and I'll send it out ASAP. Now it's time for the new contest. To enter, here's what you got to do. You got to like the Screaming Toilet Facebook page. All this stuff will be below. You got to go to the link this is on this on the screaming toilet it'll be below as well comment and say enter me in the contest and leave your email address uh besides that all you have to do is also be subscribed to my youtube channel so what you'll win here is uh you have to be 18 to enter this one because the movie's a little bit more graphic uh but this is uh arrow's release still sealed of we are the flesh which is a very crazy different uh I believe it's Mexican horror film. Uh, I reviewed this surreal, very highly sexual. Uh, I guess people compare it to Jodorowsky. But yeah, this is a really weird movie. So all you got to do is go down, like the Screaming Toilet Facebook page, uh, leave a comment underneath, not this video on YouTube, but the Screaming Toilet uh, uh, link, and uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Now let's get into the update. We have some Blu-rays here, I think just one DVD. We will get into uh, Breakout. This is a German import of the Charles Bronson movie. Uh, I have not had a chance to pop this in. It says it's Region B. It's Sony. But uh, yeah, not seen this one. Came recommended. That's Breakout. Red Sun with Charles Bronson as well. This is like a Western uh, film. With, it looks like some of the Japanese influence as well. But this is a Studio Canal, Region B. We have another Region B here uh, from Arrow. Runaway Train with John Voight and Eric Roberts. Only heard good things about this movie. We got one from I ordered from Mondo Macabro. This is sold out now. This is the two disc of Bloody Friday. But uh, this has two cuts of it. It's a German movie. Kind of supposed to be a crime movie. Pretty extreme. Looks cool. Then we have uh, Cabo Blanco. <laughs> I probably have to hear that pronounced out loud. This is a Charles Bronson movie. Kino did this one. Jason Robars is also in it. Yeah. Jason Robars, Once About a Time in the West, Something Wicked This Way Comes, Ballad of Cable Hogue. You guys know who Bronson is. This is a Kino Lorber. Another Kino here. We have A Town Called Hell with Telly Savalas, Robert Shaw, some other people as well. Who else is in this one? I checked it out. Um, you know, uh, Al Latiria from uh, Mr. Majestic. Hope I said his name right. He's a Mr. Majestic. But yeah, this one sounded fun. Next, Charles Bronson, Assassination. These are Kino as well. Not sure how this one is. Not heard much. We have White Buffalo with Will Sampson and Charles Bronson. This is like a Western, kind of has some real moments, I guess. We have this one right here uh, called A Bullet for a General from Blue Underground. This is Klaus Kinski in it. Not seen this one. Two disc special edition as well. Next, we have Sweet Sugar from Vinegar Syndrome. If you guys see something you really want me to review, mention it. Say review that one, damn it. But uh, yeah, this is a exclusive from Vinegar Syndrome, so wise. Cool stuff. Next, we have Red Mob, also exclusive. I believe these are both sold out. Nice slip covers. Vinegar Syndrome just does such a good job, man. They also sent along this nice little catalog, which is freaking beautiful. Has all their titles in here. Love it. I, I skimmed through it. I was really impressed. Then we have, uh, and I'm not easily impressed. Wow, a green car. Simpsons reference, sorry. We have the autopsy of Jane Doe. I walked into Walmart. You know, I did it, and I saw it, and I canceled my order on Amazon and bought it. Heard good things only. Uh, also saw this in a bin at, at Amazon. Kelly's Heroes and Where Eagles Dare. Never saw Where Eagles Dare. Seen Kelly's Heroes a few times. Love Kelly's Heroes. Great cast again. You got Clint Eastwood, Donald Sutherland, Telly Zavallis, and Don frickin' Rickles. Also, Harry Dean Stanton's in that movie. 
Uh, we have Backdraft, which I think I saw parts of at a young age. I don't know if I ever saw the whole thing, though. It's one of those deals, but Kurt Russell's in it. And uh, last is a DVD of Alien Killer, a.k.a. The Borrower, uh, by John McNaughting. This is a German import. It looks like it has English-friendly uh, language track, and uh, I don't know. It's in 1331. I don't know how the picture quality is going to look. Hopefully good, because this movie's never been on Blu-ray. I have a laser disc. But The Borrow is a really cool movie with Tom Tolls and, uh, you know, uh, Ray Day Chong. Is that her name? Ray Dawn Chong. Yeah, but, yeah, that's uh, uh, Mr. Parker. Uh, the, all the links and all the information for this stuff will be below. If you want to buy something, the link for that will be below. If you need more information and things like that, all of it's below in the description box. Again, thank you for watching, as always. And uh, you guys have a good one.